Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of History After Hours podcast. My name is Kevin Pumphrey, and with me, as always, is Mr. Ron Franklin, and we are history teachers at Lakeside High School in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And today, we have a very special Veterans Day podcast. Uh, We try to do something at least once a year. We probably should do this more often, but as history teachers... Obviously, we talk a lot about politics and the military, the United States, and all the social issues that are involved. But I'm a civilian, and so is Mr. Franklin. We've never served in the military. And so what we do is, at least once a year, we like to get vets that actually work at Lakeside that are non-active. You know, they used to be in the military to some degree at different places. And um, today on the podcast, we are interviewing Uh, Adam Burrell and his father, Ray Burrell, who actually enlisted at the same time. And they have wonderful insight into the military experience, the value of the military, um, and of course, some of the problems that are occurring within the military in politics. And especially we we get into PTSD and some of the horrible things and uh, that can occur after service. And um, so I think this is a very useful podcast. Uh, please share it if you've enjoyed it, if you learn it from it. Uh, you can find us, of course, on YouTube at History After Hours or on Twitter and Facebook and on SoundCloud. And so with that, enjoy this special Veterans Day podcast. Okay, guys, so uh, we are here in honor of Veterans Day, so we are going to go around the room and let people introduce themselves and uh, and uh, kind of the introduction of their service and all that to our country. So, My name is Felix Adam Burrell. Uh, served uh, four tours, uh, three in Afghanistan, one in Iraq, uh, all as an intelligence professional, uh, primarily supporting the Army, uh, along with uh, some other assignments with the Marine Corps and Special Operations. Uh, my name is also Felix Burrell. My middle name is Raymond, though. I go by Ray. Um, They're brothers. And not exactly. Um, he is my oldest son. We actually joined together. We went through basic training and AIT together. Had the same job, same rank, same everything. He had the opportunity to go overseas. I did not because of the unit that he chose, um, that he ended up in. So uh, and we'll talk more about that, I'm sure, as we go on. But I joined in 2008 and was discharged in 2014. Okay, great. Well, so as always, my name is Kevin Pumphrey, and with me is Ron Franklin, history teachers. And we like to do this for Veterans Day. We did this last year. And I think it's always good to hear from people that had had the experience. I mean, as history teachers, we we teach politics, we teach history, we teach military, but not experiencing it. Obviously, that's a very different thing. And so to have a firsthand account of somebody that that's been there, that's done that and then can, can relay things to, you know, civilians like me. Uh, I think that's important to do it every now and then to remind ourselves why we have Veterans Day and why we honor troops and why we need troops, because sometimes that gets lost in the shuffle as well. Right. Yeah, it's easy for us to sit here and talk about the politics of a situation or why we went into a place. But the when polit- politicians make their decisions, whether it's based on economic standards or some sort of international situation, like that doesn't always carry across to how that affects troops on the ground or or families here at home who are supporting the troops on the ground. So that's important, I think, too, to, to be able to get that especially for someone who served overseas, to get you guys in here and, and be able to lay that story out is, is massively important. And not just informative, but, it, you know, it's a, it's an important form of patriotism, too, that let other people know that these types of services are going on. And it's also a way for us to hold leaders accountable who may not be doing exactly, you know, what Absolutely. they claim they are. So that's another side that's of true. it, too. Well, let's start off with just asking you a basic question. And I like asking this question because this is where I would be. If you could go back to before you enlisted, what was going through your head and what did you think it was going to be like versus when you were there, when you landed, you were in the you know boot camp, you were doing all that. Like what were the sh- kind of the shocking aspects that you weren't didn't expect or was it similar to what you thought it might be? So you can, however y'all want to do it. Uh, I know for me it was, uh, it was more or less how I expected. Um, but I'll tell you this, it's one of those things you can, you can try to prepare for and you can kind of know at least consciously what you're getting into, but uh, the reality of the situation is that there's not a whole lot that can mentally prepare you for the uh, the shock factor that you're going to experience. Um, and something else, too, is I'll tell you, it's it's boot camp and military training is about like any other training. I, I get this question a lot where people are like, well, how hard was it really? Um, what I'll tell you is that it's as hard as you make it. 
So if you care about it and really pour yourself into it, it's going to be hard on you because you're really trying to get everything out of the training that you can. Uh, similar to any other study can be very difficult if you pour yourself into it. But, you know, with that difficulty comes uh, comes mastery. And that's that's really what you're after. Um, but, yeah, I, I'd say, you know, if I, if I were to look back, um, you know, we trained martial arts for a number of years and not just like karate or whatever. It was, you know tough stuff right. so it was brazilian jiu-jitsu muay thai kickboxing i was pretty used to getting hit in the face and getting choked <laughs> um so uh, i kind of knew what what tough was going to be like but not like that it yeah. was it was a whole other brand i had actually wanted to join uh when i was his age around 1920 i just did not for whatever reason i met his mother and and um, things happened that way and i ended up going a different direction i was 41 when i went into basic training which is very unusual I was by far the oldest guy there. They called me Grandpa at first. They didn't call me that so much after, mm -hmm. once we got going, because uh, I could out I could out train most of them anyway. Um, the um, the drill sergeants had a field day with us. They thought it was pretty funny that um, we both had the same name, rank, and everything. And and but they figured out pretty soon that we were good soldiers, and it worked out. But um, going through at 41, it was kind of like I expected. We did a lot of research. We watched all the YouTube videos and. A lot of the things that you see in there, especially in the gas chamber, that's reality. Um, there were people in there throwing up and falling out and all kind of things, and it was very similar to that, so pretty much like I had anticipated. What would you think would be, if someone was thinking about going into the military and, and thinking about boot camp specifically, like what would be a common misconception or, or misunderstanding about what they might be facing? Like people go in with this ideology perhaps, oh, it's going to be this, but are there things they run into they were not, not quite sure they were going to hit? I mean, you guys knew because you, right? But sometimes, sometimes people just sign up. Sure. Yeah. So uh, to go on to that, uh, I would say the biggest part that's going to be that'd be difficult for the vast majority of Americans today is you know a lack of physical training. Most people simply aren't used to doing things that are physical, uh, especially in today's world. I mean, the uh, the you know we talk about a lot about what kills Americans these days. That's a, that's a hot button topic. But the number one that can't thing that really kills people today is obesity. Uh, heart disease because people don't get active so it was it was kind of funny to me when we got there how many people would go to sick call because they were sore they oh, wow. they didn't yeah. know what sore no, felt like it was a, it was a I, shocking wow. feeling to them they didn't understand the difference between i'm injured and i'm just sore because i got worked out hard yesterday um so that's definitely a, a reality especially it's an increasingly um, difficult reality for for america's youth today uh, let me ask you this, too. I don't, I don't mean to interrupt, but I saw a report the other day. This was from, uh, uh, I want to say it was from Britain, perhaps. And they were surgeons who were thinking about medical residents who were coming in wanting to be surgeons. And they said the biggest problem that they're facing is not the knowledge gap, but the tactical, like the tactile, not tactical, tactile. Like they can't manipulate objects because they're so used to flipping through a two-dimensional world on their screens that they don't have the dexterity that they actually need to be good surgeons anymore. Like is that... Do you have how much hands on type stuff do you guys do? Because I, I picture running, you know, which is probably a lot of it, but how much, sure. like, m you know, how much uh, minute work do you do? Quite well? a bit, actually. Um, I mean, if you, you think about a lot of the, uh, uh, the technology that we're dealing with, is, is, you know, especially by our standards today, is really old technology. Cutting age stuff for the Army is old stuff to anybody else. So it's a lot of turn knobs buttons, plugging this into this, things like that. So that's absolutely a big deal. I mean, if you think about even uh, going to the, uh, to your rifle, you know, your rifle, there's a lot of fine motor skills that go into, um, you know, I'm up, I'm shooting, uh, my safety's back on and I'm back down. Um, you know, dropping a magazine cause there's a button there. It flows down, putting it back up, hitting that bolt release. So your bolt goes forward so you can get back in the fight. Uh, it doesn't seem like much, but you put that under pressure and that's a big deal. Uh, especially when people are used to this, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, pressing buttons on, you know, on an Xbox and not just not to take anything away from that. You know, lots of studies indicate that that's that's pretty handy for hand eye coordination, too. But it's not the same animal and the level of stress just isn't there when you're talking about, you know, at least in basic training, somebody screaming at you to get, you know, get your weapon back in the fight um, versus, you know, especially amping that up even further, you know, when there's lethal consequences. Um, yeah, it's it's a, it's a pretty big deal. I'd say that there's probably not as much as when I went in but I would, I would expect now it probably is a much bigger deal. I, I would say going back to the initial question, uh, what the expectations are, especially for young people today, they don't understand that they're going to lose their freedom. 
They're going to be told when to eat, when to go to the restroom, when to shower, when to get up, when to go to sleep, when to do absolutely everything. And they have difficulty with that. So that was hard for a bunch of them. Yeah, that's something, I, that's something you, you frequently hear and have heard you know, over the years is, well, that, that drill sergeant's not going to yell at me. Uh, I'll, I'll hit him in the face. That's super cute. Um, anyone, like I said, I, I come from a, from a martial arts background. I was used to hitting people in the face. That was my thing. Um, I can tell you that there were zero circumstances under which I would have attacked any of my drill sergeants, not even the small female ones. They, I mean, they're little spider monkeys. They'll just destroy you. Oh, the females were actually tougher than the, than the guys were for sure. Absolutely. So how confident, like in going through the process, getting trained, and I know that y'all ended up in different areas doing different things, but just working with the guys, you know, seeing how the whole thing, the inner workings of the, these, the hierarchy and how it all flows, the rules and regs and all that stuff, how confident are you in the current military, our military, America, compared to maybe you mean, other you things? mean as far as readiness goes? Just readiness and maybe, uh, you know, tactical, how well uh, of an oiled machine is it? Um, or d did you see a lot of stuff you was like, ooh, that, that's a problem. That's got to be worked on. That's not good. Because once again, from a, and of course what you can divulge, but, at, you know, being an outsider, we don't really know the inner workings. And, and we want to always say as an Americans, well, we're the best and nobody can touch us. But then, you know, people that are on the inside might see some things that I would never even think of. So did you did you notice that or was you completely confident I, in the I way think, it's built? I think an addendum question to that would also be we're spending tremendous amounts of money on military and we've had a military spending increase through Congress. Is the money being spent well, you think? That's the other side of it. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, I like I like both sides of that. So I'll, I'll address the initial question first. I, I got the I had the opportunity to serve with a lot of international troops. So I've seen a lot of what other people think right looks like. Um, and I can tell you from my perspective, uh, and I'll try to be as, you know, as uh, open-minded as, as possible here, I guess, with this answer that, you know, yes, I, I would say we are, we are more prepared and more ready than anyone else. Um, is that the best it can be? No, probably not. There's absolutely a lot of things that we could do better. Uh, you know, lots and lots and lots of things. And I can tell you from my perspective, and I can say this now that I'm out, um, that those, those issues are really from the very, very top parts of this organization. So you had in, you know, we've been in, in Afghanistan for how long now? 17 years. Yeah, it's been a minute, right? So yeah. since 2001. Um, and, you know, you have young leaders, young sergeants and lieutenants and captains that have completely wrecked the enemy on every battlefield that we've ever been put on. But for some reason, we're still not at, a, at an end state. And that's because, you know, the administrations involved and the generals at the highest level have failed to put together a winning war strategy. Um, and that's I mean, that's that's just it is what it is. Um, as far as actual readiness goes, yes, we're the greatest fighting force since the legions of Rome. Um, there's a reason that every time you put us somewhere, we annihilate everything there. There's a reason for that. Nothing can stand in front of us. Um, you know, you have the you have this area that you know that we've we've named the graveyard of empires, and I think it's aptly named if you look at throughout history at all the different people who've tried to, you know, assert their will over this place. Um, you know, the only reason you're that speaking of Afghanistan correct, specifically, correct? correct. Yeah. Um, you know, I would dare say we have done the best out of anyone there. Um, now, granted, the reason that you know, a lot of the country is has being taken back is because we've step, we've taken a step back and we're not asserting our dominance there anymore. Um, but yeah, and I think that again, that goes back to the issues with, uh, with leadership, everything rises and falls on leadership, plain and simple. And when you have general officers and, uh, and well, I'll say it presidents that do not put together a winning war strategy and do not put together an actual, you know, uh, set up, you know, a, a situation for an end state, then you're going to have a problem. Now, you know, again, going back to the, you know, the individual troops, yeah, they're destroying everything you put in front of them, um, even to the point where you tell them to go out and make friends. You go out and you tell these, these guys, these trained killers, to go out and make friends, and against all odds, against all their training, these, these people who have been trained to be a bayonet for as long as they can remember have now turned into a corkscrew and are op doing their best to open up this wine bottle, and they're making it happen. Um, but, you know, uh, the, the leadership isn't, isn't doing all that well. Now, to address what you asked about the uh, the money issue, no, I don't think the money is being spent appropriately. Um, you know, I, I think the military does warrant 
what it's asking for, but I think that we should redirect those funds for a variety of different issues, and a lot of that has to do with congressional needs. Um, Congress gets in the middle of, uh, of redirecting military funds far too often. You look at projects like the, uh, the F-35. The F-35 uh, fighter jet is, is, a, is a quagmire of millions and billions and billions of dollars that still hasn't produced an aircraft that can fight. The, the aircraft that we... Who is that it? We, is that Lockheed Martin or is that... I don't who recall is the exact mm. contractor that's involved, but I know that Congress has gotten involved multiple times in redirecting funds there when it wasn't necessary. You, you're, they are trying to insert um, an answer to a lack of a problem set. The A-10 does a better job at close air support than the F-35 ever has, period. That, and it's never seen a day of battle, not one. 17 years of war in this aircraft that we've allotted billions of dollars towards has not seen a single day of combat. What's the deal with that? You could even go further with that and look at the Global Hawk. Same issue. We have the U-2 that's been flying since the Cold War and been doing it successfully, does the, does the same job and does it better than this Global Hawk that they keep trying to, to, to make use of. And it just doesn't answer the mail in the same way that this old U-2 does. So why are we still dumping money into it? Why are we answering, you know, a why are we trying to put forth an answer to, you know, where there's not a question? I think it's the introduction to politics. It's politics, um, Congress, and as you said, all Absolutely. the way up the, the line. Uh, they're not allowing those who know how to conduct warfare to conduct it appropriately. And things get sidetracked, and politics gets in the way, and then, you know, you've got issues there. So, so what's your opinion? You know, our, our founders and other uh, leaders even after that were very careful to design our system where you have a president that is commander-in-chief but that there is a line between politics and military, and we have a Secretary of Defense that's over that. So there's all this, all this bureaucracy. But there was also a very big fear when our country was founded of a standing army, you know, that we just got out of a revolution. We were, we were scared of big armies. And, we and having to pay for it. Right, and having to pay for it. Yeah. And so there was a careful kind of balance of how big can an army be without turning into – something that we that's going to scare everybody you know or overthrow the government um we have a president currently and a previous president that neither served and now they're the they're the commander-in-chief of the largest <laughs> army in the world what's your opinion about the bureaucracy and you know what, like i said one of the fears is putting a military guy that could just that might be more war hungry or more, you know, and you have those people obviously in every, and so there's checks on all that. So what's your opinion about the way politics handles the military or specifically the concern between too big of a military and, and you know, even today, you know, the military industrial complex. Sure. So, I mean, it absolutely is a concern. I mean, that's, that's a, that's a real thing. Um, you know, and it's something we have to continue to be aware of and be wary of. Uh, of course, my opinion is that, you know, the, commander-in-chief probably should have some military experience some um, now does he need to necessarily be some kind of warlord no absolutely not uh, there's a reason that we have a civilian in charge there's a reason for that um, you know we, we don't want to have a military authoritarian style government that's bad news that is everything we tried to get away from and everything we've fought to uh, to you know defend ourselves against um, you look at uh, you know governments like Mussolini and like the uh, like the Nazis. Those are it's bad news, right? We don't want any part of that. So to that end, yeah, we absolutely have to have you know someone who's more committed to uh, to peace than for warfare. We can't have somebody who's always reaching for the spear. That's bad. That's bad for business. Um, but also to that end, yeah, I mean the guy the guy at the top needs to probably have at least some idea of how this works. Um, and maybe maybe that needs to be one of the checks and balances later down the line, um, but I mean, or maybe just service of some kind. Yeah, so of some kind. And you know, I I, I say this a lot you know, when people ask. You know, something that's frequently asked is, you know, should everyone serve in the military? No, 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 absolutely not. But should everybody serve in some way? Yeah, I think they should. Um, I, I think everybody should should have that uh, that that understanding of what it means to uh, to give of yourself without having that much given back to you. Um, and I think uh, everyone would have a greater appreciation for all that we have and all that we enjoy if they did that. Agreed. But that said, I mean, that's you're again at that point crossing another line mm -hmm. um, by forcing someone to do something that they may or may not want to do. Uh, one of the other th reasons that the military is as great as it is, that is an all volunteer force. Everybody that's there signed up to be there, everybody. And 
you know, if that changed and you had people who were there because they were obligated to or they were forced to, um, you would probably see a dramatic drop in, uh, in readiness and efficiency and probably a huge rise in, uh, in KIAs uh, if we were to get into a large-scale offensive. And I think you've seen that in, in situations where we have had a draft. Uh, you have, you know, giant units full of draftees that don't want to be there, aren't motivated to be there, and end up getting people killed. It must be frustrating to have a mission doled out for the military and then not given the resources, the strategy to get it done. They hamstring you with all this certain things, and I can understand that. But what do you say, and of course, since 2007, when the economy went tanked with the mortgage crisis, there was a big push, and has been to some degree, to shrink the size of our military. Our military is way too bloated. Our, you know, we spend way more on the military than any other, you know, the next 10 countries or whatever the stat is these days. How do you react, um, or do you even have an opinion about pulling troops? Because I know from hearing other military speak, look, this was our mission. We just, that's what we're going to go do. But do you have an opinion about when, or, or response when you hear that, hey, we've got to shrink the size of this thing, or is there even a way to feasibly do that? I mean, maybe so. Uh, my, my issue with that is that when you start to look at shrinking the military, especially when you talk about shrinking personnel, uh, I think that's a bad idea. Um, now, do we maybe need to trim the fat in some places where, you know, some folks probably are probably a little bit past their time? Yeah, absolutely. That's that I think is appropriate. But just saying we have to cut this many people by this many that by this long. That's a bad plan. That's a bad idea. And again, we can go back to looking at, you know, real resources, because if we're going to say that the real issue is resources, and I think that's kind of what we're all kind of agreeing on, is that the real issue is we're spending too much. Well, you can keep the personnel and reduce the, the amount of resources you spend. You can do both. You really can have your cake and eat it, too. But we're going to have to get Congress out of the, you know, get where they're trying to get their hands into, into this money issue with these contractors. That's got to get fixed. That's got to change. Um, and if we're, you know, a lot of times what happens is you see these people, they'll, these, uh, these congressmen, they'll, they'll try to use um, troops um, to, to get, get their way. They'll threaten, well, we're going we're gonna to cut the budget. You guys do what we want, or we're going to cut the budget. And you're going to have a whole lot of people that are and all these, all these troops that you guys say you care so much about. They're not going to get paid anymore. I mean, it's, it's political nonsense. It's just ridiculous. Uh, those guys have got to get out of the way. They've got to, and I don't mean that they need to be removed from the process. I'm not trying to say that at all, but they've, Congress has to fix itself, or we have to fix Congress. Um, they've got to get back to what they're really supposed to do, which is to do the very best they can for this country, not just for their own pocketbook. And that's the issue. They, this, this money thing has got to go. We've got to be more efficient with the way that we spend the money. Um, no, we don't need to draw down you know, as far as the size of the military. You know, we keep saying, well, it's the biggest military we've had since World War II. I can appreciate that, but we also have a separate problem set than we had from World War II. Global, um, global you know, um, homeland defense is, is a extremely complex issue. It's not something that's quite so simple as, well, we just should have everything here at home. It does not work that way. I wish it did, but the, the battlefields of today are so dynamic and so fast changing that you can't just have just stuff at home. You're gonna. You're asking to get smoked at that point. That's a bad idea. So, how important is the American presence around the world? I mean, and you know, and I've heard the argument, let's pull everybody home. And I think I'm with you. If you're not fighting there, we're going to be fighting somewhere, right? And so, it's better to fight in certain places. But how important is the American presence, the military presence? What influence? culturally or you know is there a backlash that everybody talks about we're here this is why they want to uh this is why they want to get back at us because they don't want us there anymore you know i remember watching you know the at the height of the iraq war in ramadi and you know just how tough the fighting was from building to building and finally getting it and then for political reasons all of a sudden we're yanked away and they reconquer that's got to be frustrating let me throw something in more specific too we think about uh we concentrate on Afghanistan because it's it's now currently our longest war. Right. We think about the fight against ISIS in, in northern Iraq and parts of Turkey and over there in parts of Syria. But what about the Syrian civil war itself? What about the conflict going on in Yemen? What about other parts of North Africa, let's say, perhaps, where we might see things light up? Like, are, are you do you have opinions on what we're doing in some of these other spots, too? I'm and so glad you asked. Yeah, okay. Um, so 
uh, part of my part of my duties when I was uh, when I was in Iraq that last time, and the, I was just, just everyone's uh, situational awareness. I was in Iraq in uh, 2016, so I had to get very well read on what's going on in Syria, and and specifically Syria, um, you know, Turkey, uh, some of what some of what's going on in Yemen. Uh, I had a lot to do with a lot of that, and what I can tell you is that that place is a quagmire. It is an absolute dumpster fire. Um, there are layers upon layers upon layers of uh, groups in that country, and in those, the, well, I won't even say that country, in that region, um, that change how they see each other on a weekly basis. So one week, they're buddies. The next week, they're shooting at each other. It really is that dynamic. Um, so to get involved over there, it would take a, a whole, whole lot, and a lot of decisive effort with a lot of, frankly with a lot of bloodshed and you have the larger have context which is also saudi arabian's involvement plus Absolutely. iran's involvement that's the real thing the real conflict is is, is there it's saudi arabia versus iran for who's going to hold sway over the middle east that's the real thing we have more or less chosen to uh to back the saudis um, but that also, to some degree, kind of conflicts with our, you know, how we back the Kurds and how we also back Turkey, who doesn't like the Kurds, uh, and also how we back, you know, basically what has now become a Shiite government in Iraq, who also doesn't like the Kurds. But they also have, you know, this Kurdish government in northern Iraq, who's also doing a whole lot of fighting, and they don't want the Shiites to come up there and do anything. But the Iranians want the Shiites to come in there because they, they, they back the, the, the Shiites because they basically are the Shiites. So, man, it's a train wreck. Mm -hmm. And that's the... Dumpster fire pretty much sums yeah, that up. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's, I mean, it's, it's insanity. And that is so, you're just scraping the tip of the iceberg with a scalpel with what I just said. There are so many other issues there. It's, it's insanity. But, but then to sort of go back to the, to the essence of the question, then our involvement there, as complex as it is, is it your opinion that it's still necessary? I would say that we need to um, we need to either make a decision or we need to get out of town. We need to either become a lot more decisive and decide that we're going to actually do what we need to do uh, or we need to get out of there and let whoever's going to run it run it and then we can look at cleaning up the mess later. But that's what's got to happen. We have to make a decision. This riding the line nonsense has gone on way too long. Um, it's you know you have we, we, we've basically let let Iran take over the place. That, that's a huge. That's a huge problem right now. Um, you look at Shia militia groups. That is a big deal. When we were there, when we left there in what 2011 ish, uh, if I remember, you were looking at around a thousand um, as far as uh, Shia militia group members. Now it's estimated to be in the hundreds of thousands. That's a lot. That's a big number. Um, and you have, you know, these alleged war crimes that are going on there where these, these Shia militia groups are going in uh, with Iraqi military uniforms on and just wrecking towns, just committing outright war crimes. And again, you know, either we're going to take care of this the way we know how to take care of it, or we're going to leave it, they're going to leave them to their own devices. You can't have both. Well, I guess you can, but you're, it's not going to be very effective. Uh, you're just going to be stuck in this quagmire, spending a whole bunch of money, and you know, not not uh, not accomplishing anything. I think it goes back to <clears throat> politics. I think politicians making decisions that they really have no business doing, and um, until we can get proper leadership in there, that's going to make the decisions necessary to do that. I mean, I'm like him. Let them do what they need to do. Get the politicians out of the way. Let the the um, the military leadership make those decisions, and and make something happen it almost sounds like every politician who steps out on stage and says you know we support the troops and know we love you and thank you for your service like that sort of rings hollow now to a lot of people who continue to see this inefficiency from the leadership standpoint politically and then asking troops to continue to sacrifice for something that may be protracted for the you know next 10 to 20 years it really doesn't and nobody likes to see dead americans but if something's going to happen it's going to be bloodshed, like you said. We had around 500 killed uh, KIA American troops in 2007. This year up to this day, we've had 10. So that, that right there, we had a distinctive mission at that point. We, we knew what we had to get done and taken care of. And things have gotten more and more blurry as time has passed. And we're seeing less, less KIAs, obviously, but there's not a lot of activity going on either. Do you think that there is a way, and I know that censorship to some degree during 
t times of conflict is necessary where the American public doesn't see everything. But there, it does seem like there's a pretty good veil between civilians and I mean, you know, people are, are dying and we don't know about it. We don't know exactly where people are. It seems like that these days it's kind of pushed on the back burner. Is there a way to open up communication better for the American people to actually know what's going on with the military? It's, or I mean, obviously not complete strategy and all that, but just a way that we could, we could figure out, because you know how average Americans are. They're not going to go out of their way. But is there, is there something that could be done with the communication between what the military is doing overseas and the public without politicians getting in the way? And do you think that the media has some responsibility to, uh, to tell the story better than they're telling it? Because all we ever really see are people coming home and surprising their kids by jumping out of a box. And, oh, but we don't see those people right. go back to combat zones. Right. The, right. So, so it, we get this feel good story, but we never kind of get to the essence of what's really going on. I don't know how many people in the, this country actually know how many places we have active service members actually on the ground. Oh, very yeah, few. very, very few. And I, I like what you said about the media having a responsibility. Um, and absolutely, they have they have the biggest responsibility here because they're the ones that tell the story there. That's their job to tell the American people what's going on. And the American people have placed in them a certain level of trust, whether they acknowledge it or not. Um, that what that we're going to believe what they have to say, and they haven't told the story. It seems like they're avoiding it. Any idea why that might be because true? It, it just seems that way to me, though. Because you know, stuff sell. nonsense like Stormy Daniels and whatever else is, is catches more ratings. So tabloid, absolutely, absolutely. tabloid journal journalism. Nobody's worried about being correct anymore. We're worried about being first, and it's insanity. And there's no, you don't ever see any sort of retractions when they were wrong. There's never any. We were, you know, a, no correction. There's nothing like that. Yes. So to answer, you know, your initial question, could this, you know, could the American people have a better doorway into it? Yes. Yes. The, I mean, when I was in Afghanistan in 2013, uh, even when I was with special operations, it was not uncommon to see a journalist. We saw them. They were there. They would ask us questions, and within reason, we would give them answers, and they were honest answers. It's not that we won't tell you. It's that you're not asking, um, and then past that, you're not reporting. Um, you would rather talk about you know, the president ordering a Coke from somebody. I mean, what are we doing, guys? Or two scoops of ice cream instead of the one that everyone yeah. else was getting. Are you, are you, are Ridiculous. You, how is this news? I'm not saying the president is infallible. I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not really trying to make a comment on how effective the president is or isn't. But I'm telling you that the fact that that is news, instead of a soldier being shot in a green on blue incident last Saturday, that is absolute insanity, and it is it is it is ridiculous that that's that that's what we're that's what we're talking about. Question for you guys out there, and you can buy a show of hands. How many of you knew that last Saturday we lost a soldier in a green or blue on green attack? Anybody have any idea? Do you even know what a green on blue attack is? Did you know we lost a soldier in Afghanistan? An American soldier died, was killed in action in Afghanistan. He was a mayor in Utah, in a town in Utah. He was a major. That's no. the problem right there. It's not your fault, so right. don't, don't take offense to that. You weren't told because the media failed you. That's the problem. You were failed. It, it was a blurb that was hidden in about five stories in on most media sites, if they even covered it at all. And they didn't really talk about the circumstances. They just said that, hey, this Utah mayor died. And then they went and talked about people who knew him and like, oh, well, it affected the community, which is OK. But they didn't tell the what led to that or the problems that may have caused it. What that basically is, is we, we're over there trying to train other people to do the job that we're doing for them at the moment, trying to get people on the ground in Afghanistan, Afghanistan soldiers themselves to take care of their own situation so that we can back out and go do other things. This situation was a man in uniform who was an Afghani soldier turned on our troops and opened fire. So sort of like friendly fire if you want to get down to it. So let me ask you a question that I know it's concerning me and it's concerning a lot of people, but I don't think it's being spoken loud enough, especially in the media where people need to know, and, and that is the suicide rate among returning troops that have seen action, that is PTSD, and the ineffective way that we are helping returning soldiers deal with the problems. Can you guys speak a little bit about and, that, And please? the VA probably yeah, along, the with VA that. along with that. Another question I'm really, really glad you guys brought up because um, this is another thing I can speak firsthand to. Uh, I'm a disabled vet. I'm 70% disabled, according to the VA. Uh, large portion of that is due to uh, post-traumatic stress. And I've received a variety of different <laughs> treatments, both inpatient and outpatient, uh, lots of different medications. Um, here's, here's my perspective, and, and granted, this is one person uh, in, a, in a large, large, large system. Um, 
with varying levels of success with different veterans. But what I can tell you is that a lot of it is, uh, well, it's frankly, it's ineffective. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't work. We as a, uh, as a, as a society and as a, well, and our government isn't doing enough to get veterans the help that they need. And that's really, that's really, I would dare say that's a, that's an issue really more with, um, the American people as a whole than it is really even necessarily something to, to do with veterans. We don't treat mental health the way we should. We just don't. Um, if, if someone has the flu and can't go to work, then we're like, okay, cool, you've got the flu, you need to stay home. If someone has a mental health issue, we don't treat that like it's a disease. We treat that like, well, that person's just not trying hard enough. Have we offered that person an ounce of help? Have we, you know, if you've never tried to go get mental health help, it is a nightmare. Especially if you, I couldn't imagine being a civilian and needing it because you're not going to get it. It's the, the waiting list is forever long. Um, the uh, trying to get that covered by your insurance because the payments on it are insane is, is a nightmare. And that's that's that that is a, a an issue that, um, you know, you, you, I don't I hesitate to drop this, too. But um, you look at uh, gun violence and violence in general. A lot of that is is uh, that stems from a mental health problem mm -hmm. and we don't treat it right. Uh, and in the same the same concept, you know. We don't give veterans the, the help that they need. Let me jump in there as a, as a veteran, as a son of a veteran. He has PTSD. My father served in Vietnam. My son come back. He's got PTSD. One in eight are diagnosed. One in eight soldiers, you name it, uniformed soldiers um, that come back are diagnosed. Those are the ones who actually try to reach out for help. A lot of them do not because of the tag and the stigma that goes along with it. And that's it killed one my career. Ones. My career is over because Absolutely. I asked for help. Absolutely. And, and we, we say we support our veterans. We say, you know, companies say it, people say it. Yes, most people will say we support our veterans as long as they're okay. If they come back and they're broken, they don't support them anymore. They kind of shush them to the side and they ignore them. Why do we see so many veterans that are homeless, that are, that are blowing their brains out or, or taking their own lives 20 to 22 every single day, every single day, over 20, take their own lives? We know some of them. We've trained with some of them. He's, he's seen it firsthand. That's the problem. Is, is not not reaching out and, and making sure that they have the attention, the acknowledgement that they need, and not just in words. I've read recently too that um, that opioid addiction amongst returning veterans is high too, and I wonder if that ties in with the PTSD as aspect. I know that sometimes people have actual physical pain as well, and that can cause addictions because opioids are so powerful. But I wonder if they're being prescribed pain treatment for for a mental condition as well. I wonder if that's part of it. Maybe, but I can tell you also, because a big part of my other um, um, issues that I have from uh, from my service is, you know, I've got a lower back problem. And, you know, I do that the best I, I, I cope with that the very best that I can, but I, you know, I can't, uh, I can no longer take any sort of uh, anti-inflammatory. So ibuprofen's out. Um, you know, if you, there's a, if I'm familiar with any sort of medication, that's a long list of stuff you can't take anymore, and it's a really short list of things you can do about it. I can tell you that now um, it's next to impossible to get anything like that through the VA. And so maybe that was an issue, but I would dare say they've gone overboard with trying to keep it away from people uh, because now you have people who, so who were managing went it. way too far. Absolutely, and that's due to, I would dare say, that's due to Jeff Sessions and his crusade against opioids and you know uh, did something need to be done absolutely did we need to just be like cold turkey everybody's off no um and that's again you know, if you look even outside of the military you have a lot of people who ended up turning to heroin because they were managing what they had mm -hmm. well enough and then they don't have now they don't have anything and now they're like well i need something or right. i'm gonna die yeah um, so there is i mean there's a level of responsible absolutely uh, pain management that the government could sure. help with as opposed to what they like you said cutting people off right and that yeah. goes back to you know, bureaucracy again you have i would dare say that a lot most of the people in the va healthcare providers and whatnot want to help vets but a lot of times they're hamstrung by this regulation or that regulation because they are run by administrators that are not healthcare professionals or not mental health professionals. And so they're bound by these insane regulations. I was in an inpatient program for a while and I can tell you that I saw some of the most insane stuff while I was there. Just the most ridiculous way that veterans were treated and handled. Uh, we were treated like inmates at a jail instead of patients. And they expect us to get better in this program. And I'm like, guys, this is not how this works. I made visitations. I took him out there. I went and picked him up. And, and this is this is a big part of the problem. Those in the name of trying to help someone are causing more damage because of the way they're being treated. 
Like I said, they weren't being treated like human beings. I mean, it was like school kids or inmates that were in a prison that were in trouble. The way they spoke to them, no respect whatsoever. I mean, it was ridiculous. It was frustrating for me as his father. We talked about money and spending money wisely on the military. It seems like this area for maybe for doctors, because you know, without money, things generally don't change. Right. So as far as neurologists and psychologists and people that can study this, because obviously mental health, it's a difficult thing to study. It's not, there's, sometimes there's no even physical symptoms. You don't even, you can't notice it walking down the street. I know if someone is missing an arm, if they have the flu, they, they have very diagnosable things. In mental health, it, I think we're at the cusp of starting that, but it seems like that could be something that could help is trying to find people and especially doctors and the people that are involved with the military, that they've seen it firsthand, that can come back. You know, those people should be paid and for their research. And instead and of hurting them. people through, like treat them like individuals right. who have individual issues that need to be dealt with. I mean, it's the complete, the complexity, I think, leads to complacency. And therefore, people just throw money at the problem without right. actually solving anything. And they, we just we, and other people go, well, we feel good about ourselves because mm -hmm. we we said we did something. Right. Right. So uh, and I, going back to what you said with people who have experience in this, I can tell you the very best psychologist I, or psychiatrist I ever saw was a, a fellow by the name of uh, Dr. Peyton Hurt in Charlottesville, Virginia. He was a retired colonel and saw people just like me coming out of coming out of a uh, a combat zone and he he was uh, he was stationed in germany for a long time that guy understood more about uh, what i was going through and what was necessary to help me get going and get you know get back to at least some semblance of normal than anybody else yeah a level of empathy right been but the trouble is that there's no there's little to no incentive for those guys to actually stay and be there because they're again they're hamstrung by a whole bunch of nonsense they can't do their jobs uh, they can't help people the way they know to help people because of this regulation and that regulation and this regulation and that regulation i've had doctors look at me and tell me that they can't do what they would do for me because they have to put me through this physical therapy or this this screening program or this talk group uh, I have to sit and talk about you know um, for instance I had an issue I still have an issue with my back they wanted me to go through a certain amount of physical therapy and then I had to go through a, and talk to a pain management group so I had to sit in a group with other veterans and talk about how my pain was and how that affected me day to day and then they wanted me past that to go talk about how to do some uh, some controlled breathing exercises and I'm like guys I want to go be active I want to do something to help myself I just need a little help to get there and they're like we can't that is ridiculous yeah. that we would treat a veteran. I mean, I wouldn't get – people wouldn't put up with that. Civilians would be like, I'm not doing that. And You're Congress right. allows it. Wow. Congress allows it. You have – and I'll go ahead and name drop, but, you know, we had so much support for, uh, for Bernie Sanders. And Bernie Sanders was the chairman of the VA Oversight Committee for a very, very long time and did nothing. Nothing. And he's one of very many who oversee all these all, all these these programs and say that they want to do something for us and want to help us. The uh, the support for troops um, is a hollow promise. Absolutely. It's 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 inaccurate. It's not there. And if they really want to do something about it, they would. But the fact is, they don't because we're zero point four five percent of the voting population, yep. and it is fun to say something about it. But the reality is, is that no one's going to notice if we get shuffled out the door, um, and and twenty two of us a day kill ourselves um, because they're doing nothing about it. If if you doubt what he's saying, go sit in a clinic, the VA clinic or a hospital for any length of time, and watch the way that those veterans are treated. Watch how these, yeah, I, it's, 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 it's insane to me. I'll, I'll go into these clinics, I'll sit down, and I just have to button my lip because if you say anything, you won't get taken care of. Wow. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. Crazy. And no one will acknowledge it, no one will say it, and there's probably no way to prove it. But the reality is, is unless you're quiet, you're not going to get taken care of. They will put you on the back burner and they will make you leave. What was it a couple of years ago where they had like two lists at, like, what was it? Uh, which hospital was it? Um, where they had like a, the list that they were showing to the, the government officials and then they had the real list which had people backlogged for like mm. almost a year or something like that. You, you remember? I, I remember the what, story. I don't remember which hospital it was now. Uh, I think it was more than just one place. I, th I think it's it was. It's because these people yeah, can't get been, fired. Yeah, maybe they more. can't get fired. And what you'll see a lot of times when these when some of these... Walter these, Reed, maybe, was it? I don't know, probably. Possibly. Um, but the bigger issue is these people can't get fired. And when you see some of these higher-end administrators in the VA, they do get fired. They don't really get fired. They get yeah. shuffled around. Right, They're yeah. just somewhere else. Relocated. Now. Absolutely. Yeah. They're doing the same job somewhere else, messing up other vets and not helping people. Well, all right. So that brings us to our to our big question then, which is 
when we hear people, especially on on Veterans Day or our Memorial Day or whatever it is, like we say, we 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 want to support the veterans. We want to support our troops. We want to support our, our men and women in uniform. Like, what, in your opinion, would be the best way for for civilians like Kevin and myself, sure. or, or, or students that may be listening, or or the politicians and people out in society? Like, what would the very best way to say to show that they mean that we support veterans like what would be the best thing to do so there's a few organizations that actually do stuff to help vets and i'll plug one that i'm involved with because they 80 something percent of the money that gets donated to them actually goes directly to, to troops or programs that are helping troops and it's called mission 22 mission 22's goal is to it's you know the the 22 in there is stands for the 22 vets a day that kill themselves and their goal is to you know get down to zero even one is too many and what they do is they have a variety of programs that they help veterans with that you know specifically guys that have deployed and are diagnosed with stuff um, to help them to get them fixed um, my, my gym right down the road it uh, we have a partnership program with them we have two vets in there right now both that are, that are both combat vets one of them uh, got shot back in 2011 he's in there all the time and this is his therapy you sit down and talk to that guy and he'll tell you that this stuff does more for him than uh, any 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 sort of uh, treatment program ever and what allows us to do that is mission 22 sends me a little bit of money on for on his behalf every month that allows me to help keep my doors open so I can help more vets and that sort of program that that is what is going to make the difference but you still you got to do your research you can't just give to just anybody and I'll, I'll yeah. go ahead and say this too don't donate to Wounded Warrior Project those guys don't help vets not really I've reached out to them myself more than once to try to get help and they send me they put me on an email list are you joking an email list I'm telling you that that I'm falling apart, that my I can't keep a job because I, I can't keep my head straight. I can't sleep at night. I'm depressed out of my mind. I don't want to get out of bed. And you put me on an email list. That's mm -hmm. your level of help. And you have how many sponsorships? You've got, you, mean, you, guys, you guys work with Under Armour. There's millions of dollars in your budget and you're doing what? Advertising. So, exactly. Do your research. Give to an organization that is actually helping people. And there's plenty of them out there. I just plugged Mission 22 because it's one I'm involved with. But there's lots more. Do your research. Give your time and your money. Because there's also plenty of things you can do as far as uh, volunteering. You don't have to give money. Mm -hmm. uh, sign up to be a Mission 22 ambassador. There's plenty of stuff. And we need more in Arkansas. There's plenty of stuff you can do to help vets right here in this town. Um, it's, it's, it's a matter of, of actually going and doing it. The, the biggest thing for me, I was asked this question yesterday and last week too, is uh, an awareness, an acknowledgement of troops out there. Make sure that you're aware that they're there. Don't just think of them on, you know, one day out of the year on Veterans Day, but make sure you're investing somewhere where you can actively pursue at least acknowledging that they're there and they have issues. And don't shush them when they act like they, they don't have it all together, when they're broken and, and they don't act normal. Are veterans offended when they only get the one day a year sort of nod? Or is, or is no. there still the appreciation, like at least this day, so we get something? I'll speak to I'll speak to again, just to to us really, because you know obviously veterans are just a cross section of the rest of, well, of the sure population, right. and there's plenty of plenty of you know veterans out there that are just awful human beings, that, you know that exist. Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, anybody? Um, so to to that end, um, no, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that. It's not that, and it's not an, a matter of entitlement. Um, you know. People that sign that sign up to do what we did, we I, I didn't sign up for you know the free barbecue I had on Sunday. That's not why I did what I did. It was nice to have, um, but that's you know if I didn't get it, would I be upset? No. Well, let me let me rephrase it. Does it does it feel disingenuous? No, I wouldn't say so. What would be? I mean, you would, would hope that it wouldn't. Right. What what would be what would be better again is if people would would vote better. Uh, people would you know make their elected officials more aware that taking care of us is a big deal and held and them accountable you, yeah and then if you don't we're not you're not going to get my vote next year um and then to have those same elected officials actually do what they say they're going to do if you say you're going to take care of vets then do it um don't just you know tell me that you know you can check on my status because i had i had one of our you know elected officials in town you know they, they always say contact my office we'll help you they, they won't they, they won't um, i'll say that and you, know, you can take your guess on which one it was um so hold them accountable make them actually have to work for their money they're getting paid plenty make them do what they say they're going to do uh that would be better for me uh i would rather i would rather see that than a billion and one you know yellow stickers on people's cars saying we support the troops i don't care about that uh, that, that doesn't do anything for me and my friends that are killing themselves. That doesn't, you know, I, I've got 
I got three names that I recite pretty regularly of guys that guys and one female that that killed themselves. Good friends of mine that I either trained with or fought with. And it's Kren Miner, um, Kathy Wolf and Mike Wagnon. Mike wasn't a, a veteran yet, but he had deployed overseas in a uh, in a civilian capacity multiple times and, and was about to go to be the Navy, go to join the Navy before he uh, before he killed himself. Um, I want that to not happen anymore. I want my government to do what they said they were going to do and to take care of me and my friends the way they said they were going to. We did our job. Do yours. It's your turn now. Do your job. And you're not. When, whenever I go to the VA clinic and I see this poor old World War veteran, World War II veteran, getting shoved around like he's a child, you're not doing your job. And if that lady's not doing her, not, not being the way she needs to be, not remembering that she's in a customer service field serving veterans, that she's not just in a government job, that she's not just collecting a paycheck, she needs to be fired. And I shouldn't be afraid to say something, but I have to be. Fix it. Fix it. Make your elected officials fix it. Is that why a lot of veterans don't speak out? Though? Yes. Is because they, of the nobody, retaliation? Maybe? Absolutely. And nobody, most people don't even want to go to the VA. You have plenty of people who won't go and they'll just deal with problems. I'm, I'm one of them. You know, my, my knee is jacked up right now. My back is jacked up because of the stuff they, they offered me to help me just wasn't enough. And it's not enough to go through all the nonsense to just be told again that we're not going to do anything for you. It's just not worth it and not to be treated that way. I'm a grown adult. Uh, I, I, you know, I deployed multiple times to serve this country and I'm not going to be treated like a child. I won't. And yeah, n no one wants to deal with it, especially then to get to the very end of it and be told, meh. We're still not sure. I got scoped not too long ago because they thought I had cancer. I had an upper GI scope. I never, there was no, they, they said, well, it's not cancer, but we're really not sure what it is. So we're going to keep going with this? Are we going to do something else? No. That's reality. That is reality for nearly every veteran that's out there that, that seeks help. And there's the, the worst part about this is my story is mild, yeah. is exceptionally mild compared to some of the insanity that's out there. Well, guys, this is what I wanted. I wanted a useful conversation. As teachers, we want to educate people. We can't do that with this subject. You can. And I, I want to thank you both for sharing your experiences and sharing your frustrations yep, and definitely. sharing uh, your angle. Uh, you know, one of the things that I want to do as a teacher, I think Mr. Franklin is too, is, is bridge this gap. It's not you and us. It's not, uh, it's not, oh, well, our military and I'm over here. We're a team, whether we like it or not. Um, yes, you are the guys that stick your neck out and defend our country, and I do appreciate that. But I think citizens need to realize that we're a part of this just as much, and there's just as much, like you had said earlier, there's just as much stuff that we could do to help this situation out. Yes, sir. Well, thank you very much, and uh, happy Veterans Day. <laughs>